uh, Queen H8, and now actually Black resigned. So why did Black resign? Well, King E6, Bishop C6, and um, it's very difficult for Black to do anything. So he's lost, you know, any real threats on the second rank. And you know, say he did take, then there's Queen E5 mate. So basically, Kotov, you know, if you look at his games in the Hastings Congress 1962. You know, they weren't these, like, tactical monster games. They were positional games with white, which is kind of evidence, actually, that, um, you know, I, I think we should t take Think Like a Grandmaster with, with a pinch of salt. And this separation really disturbs me, um, you know, between, you know, assessing and planning and, and then calculating variations. Because, uh, you know, I, I personally, you know, like to see, you know, calculation as a means to an end, to test hypotheses. And... I'm sure a lot of you might, you know, disagree with a lot of the things I've said. This is a highly controversial video where this game is just the backdrop for my current thinking. But what really nudged it was was this notion of exploitable uh, weaknesses, where that term carries with it, you know, a combination of looking at, you know, a static properties of position, but this cynicalism which puts that in context. So anyway, knight d5 seems seems to be a nice tactical moved by white here and perhaps um, John should have played something like Queen e6 but apparently to Ripple white's got a clear advantage after Queen e6 um, with still Queen c, c d2 or Queen d2 and so what can black do here um, if knight e4 then maybe take and in this position bishop takes king takes and now either b5 or rook ac1, b5, let's see what that does. So say takes, then knight, knight c3. So white ends up with a big advantage here. Um, so it was a difficult position for black out, outside of, from, from an English opening. And we'll look at other Kotov games in this tournament, and we'll see how positional or tactical they were. So you can see, you know, was this maze of if then really used by Kotov or not? But anyway, I hope I hope uh, you you can indulge me in this in this theoretical discussion that there are actually two projects given, I believe, to Kotov and Botvinnik, which are extremely you know fundamentally flawed because um, you know humans excel at intuition and computers at calculation. Although we are seeing the influence of you know wanting to play like computers nowadays. Um, and I'll explore that in the next video, a conversation with Gavin Crawley uh, recently in Hebden that, uh, that occurred one morning of the London Classic. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the next video. Uh, so please bear with me on this. Uh, I want to elaborate this discussion a bit more. Thanks very much. OK, this is the year before where John Littlewood was white against Mikhail Botvinnik and it was a Sicilian uh, dragon this position came out of. And uh, Black's just played knight takes b3. So anyway, I'm arguing that, uh, that Botvinnik and Kotov were instrumental in that they were given these projects to investigate as well as being sent overseas to play in things like the Hastings Congress. So in 1961, you know, Mikhail Botvinnik was there and playing black. So uh, C takes B3 was played, which uh, was kind of a dynamic move, because A takes B, and you know black might be able to play things like Queen A5, Rook C8, and it would be difficult for, for, for white to avoid maybe an exchange sack later and a quick D5. But this way he could share the C file. And this became a famous loss, actually, of John Littlewood, uh, because it seems he, he had a very promising attack going. So he went for black's uh, Fianchetto bishop, so anyway, coming back to this, this project discussion, let's imagine, you know, that Botvinnik was given this project and he was doing, you know, investigating these knowledge-based approaches to writing um, computer programs. Um, Kasparov has alluded that, that you know, that the projects uh, didn't really come to much because brute force took over. So, you know, what is brute force? It's this computers are getting faster and faster. So really... Um, the intelligence uh, didn't they didn't need to be so intelligent so long as their uh, you know evaluation function was was reasonably okay they could look at millions and millions of positions with the brute force approach and that would mean less of a need to be more prescriptive in how they would you know play certain positions for, from uh, sort of human type considerations they they can actually play to the you know the very specific nuances that positions contained um and here, by the way, uh, so John Littlewood sacrificed the whole piece now with this very aggressive, hyper-aggressive move, h4. 
So he wants to just speed up his attack, and he doesn't mind sacrificing the C3 knight. And Mikhail Botvinnik, you know, he was he was a very good calculator of variations. He has played a very, you know, sharp, provocative opening with black. And he doesn't trust the opponent's uh, calculation that uh, that this that this attack is as, as ferocious as it looks after h4. So he plays, he snaps off the knight with b takes c3. And it looks as though, you know, John Lutterwood, who, as I mentioned, was one of Britain's greatest, you know, attacking players. It looks as though his attack might break through here, break through. So he plays h5. And um, Mikhail Botvinnik casually kind of, you know, he, you know, the h file looks quite dangerous here, doesn't it? Uh, if white's going to peel open the h file, you know, and black's simply going to be mated, it would seem. Uh, so this is why this this game came kind of famous because there's this cliffhanger, uh, which which is going to happen. So anyway, um, Black played D takes E5, and the natural move here for White is just to take on G6, and it would seem as though you know isn't Black getting obliterated? So H takes G6 was played, and Mikhail Botvinnik played knight f6. By the way, Botvinnik, if you don't know, you know he there was this kind of Botvinnik school of chess, which you have uh, prodigies like Kasparov, Kramnik, and Karpov all being within the Botvinnik school. So not only he was doing this research in, in into the early chess playing computers, you know he was a big influence directly on you know the next generation. And you know Kasparov regarded him, you know, as his, his trainer for for a long period of of time, but you know was I you know I think aware of his his attempts at writing these knowledge based you know computer chess playing programs. So after knight f6, b takes c3. Now black really doesn't seem to have anything to worry about here. The mating threat seems to have been extinguished with black's you know knight on f6, and. Um, John played, after e takes d4, he played g takes h7, now king h8. And if only white could try and remove this f6, or maybe get into g4 with, you know, rook g4 to threaten, um, you know, queen g7, mate, and there wouldn't be, you know, rook g8 because of takes. So maybe that was his plan. But, you know, when he played rook takes d4, maybe he still had some optimism here. And... You know, it seems perversely actually that the, the previous game I've shown you, where where you know apparently um, you know Kotov, who's supposed to be the master of you know tactics, if you, if you judge it by his book, that he's the master of calculation and, and sharp positions. You know, played quite a positional game. I mean, there was a tactical part of the game, but this is a really tactical game. You know, from the Sicilian Dragon, and um, Mikhail Botnik just played Queen A5 here, and. It seems that um, Black has sufficient resources here to beat off uh, the the attacking attempts. Uh, so why did White play Queen E3? Let's have a quick look at this. If Rook G4, you know what would happen here? Um, well, unfortunately, just Knight takes G4 because because there's, there's, there's nothing which happens after Knight G4. Uh, so really, C C3's attacked. So John played queen e3 just to defend c3. So, you know, maybe he, he's just two pieces down here. Knight d5, queen d2. Black just took on c3. And after rook a d8, you know, where is the attack? Which which seemed so promising a while back. After rook c1, Mikhail just played queen takes a2, just exchanging off the queens. And after rook takes, rook takes... Uh, you know, White resigned. So a seemingly really dangerous, you know, peace sack from earlier was just very calmly uh, re refuted, really. So I think the key thing, what why White's attack failed, is that when White's pawn on e5 was exchanged off, it, it meant that knight f6 was just a very powerful, just-in-time uh, defensive move. So just hg, seemingly the wrath of white's play, but because the white pawn on e5 has, has just been zapped, here just knight f6, and it seems you know white's 
attack is, is not, not doing anything. Riv Rivka actually gives knight c2 as, as a good try for, for white, for some reason. So let's say queen a5. Maybe there's rook d7 here. So the knight can't move because of, because of h7. Um, and let, let's see, a routine move here for, for black might have ended in disaster, say fg. Well, rook takes b7. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, actually. If rook b8, then apparently rook takes e7. And in this position, th this would be devastation for black, even though black is a piece up. So this is, this is an interesting side variation for what could have happened. For example, um, say, say queen b6. Then here, g takes h7. 